Hello, my name's Paul Geary and I'm a lecturer in drama at the University of East Anglia. In this short talk, I'm going to introduce some ideas and theatrical practices around designing multi-sensory performance worlds. When we think of theatrical design and sonography, we often think of material designed for its visual appeal. We think of how the stage looks using techniques and approaches from the visual arts, from painting, sculpture and even screen technologies. It's not surprising that we do this. The visual often dominates our culture and sight is historically one of the privileged senses associated with distanced critical reflection and with knowledge. Sight and sound are the dominant senses in the arts used for painting, sculpture, music, opera and theatre. But sight and sound are not the only senses available to us when designing performance. With the rise of immersive and participatory performances, where the audience are inhabiting the world of the work alongside the performers, we can design performance spaces that appeal to the other senses too, to touch and smell and even to taste. The 21st century has seen the proliferation of immersive theatres, where audiences are invited into the world of the performance and are immersed in that world, imaginatively, physically and sensorially. As Josephine Machen writes in her book, Immersive Theatres. Immersive is a term once solely used as an adjective and now increasingly applied to suggest a genre of theatre. Immersion defines the action of immersing or the state of being immersed, whereas immersive, developed from computing terminology, describes that which provides information or stimulation for a number of senses, not only sight and sound. These definitions help to highlight how immersive experiences in theatre combine the act of immersion, being submerged in an alternative medium where all of the senses are engaged and manipulated, with a deep involvement in the activity within that medium. And so, an immersive theatrical experience is one that immerses its audience participants in the world of the performance, submerging their whole sensate bodies into the work. To think about performance operating primarily through sight and sound is insufficient for these practices. There is an appeal to other sensory modes, to touch and smell and taste. Given that the arts have historically been dominated by sight and sound, we have very sophisticated languages and techniques for working with images and noises. The so-called lower senses of touch, smell and taste have largely been neglected in the fine arts, because they were not associated with high culture, with rationality, nor with distanced aesthetic reflection and contemplation. Immersive theatres are playing a role in changing this by consciously incorporating multi-sensory elements into the design and construction of performance. Though this is by no means a new phenomenon, Theatrical experiments from the 19th century onwards played around with sensations other than sight and sound in performance. The symbolists, working in Paris at the end of the 19th and into the 20th century, explored using smell in performance. Paul Napoleon Roynard's production of Song of Songs at the Théâtre d'Art in December 1891 released different odours including incense, orange blossom and jasmine, into the auditorium by means of handheld vaporizers, with the smell specifically chosen to work with or reflect what was happening on stage. The Italian futurists, working in the first half of the 20th century, created plans for performances that included experimental food to be eaten, and even an event where the audience wore pyjamas made from materials like sponge, sandpaper, cardboard and velvet, which they could feel during the event. Contemporary immersive theatre is often designed to create a coherent artistic world that appeals to different sensory streams. Perhaps the most famous contemporary immersive theatre company in the UK is Punch Drunk. Founded in the year 2000, Punch Drunk continue to make large-scale immersive theatrical events. In Punch Drunk's work, the audience wear masks 
and are given license to explore the space, often stumbling across performers or discovering details hidden within the theatrical world. Punch Drunk's latest show, The Burnt City, is set in the final days of Troy, before the invasion of the Greeks, reworking the myth of the Trojan War by placing it in a world reminiscent of the 1920s. The audience are introduced to this world by being led through an exhibition space, where ancient objects are displayed in glass cabinets. From this exhibition space, where you can look but not touch, the audience are plunged into the midst of the theatrical world, a 1920s city where they're allowed to wander, to explore and to touch. The setting for the show was designed to create realistic spaces, with cupboards and drawers that could be opened, diaries and notebooks to be discovered and read, beds that could be sat or laid on, and a bar where the audience could buy a drink and watch a cabaret act. Following a specific pathway could take the audience over a border into the world of the Greeks, where there were cavernous spaces with the ground covered in sand, where, if you arrived at the right moment, you saw Agamemnon's sacrifice of his daughter Iphigenia to appease the gods and allow the Greeks' passage to Troy. The ability to touch, to handle objects and to feel the texture of the ground under your feet is a significant element of Punch Drunk's world building. It contributes to the feel of the world, in multiple senses of that word feel, relating to touch, to more generally how it feels to inhabit this world, and to the investigative approach on offer to the audience to feel out the show and the things hidden in this constructed world. Punch Drunk appealed to the different senses to build the complexity, richness and realistic detail of the world of their performances. But there are other ways of deploying the different senses in performance design. In 2012, the artists Bompass and Parr created a performative installation at the Royal Shakespeare Company in Stratford called The Waft That Woos. Inspired by the themes of love and confusion in Shakespeare's The Merry Wives of Windsor, Bompass and Parr created a mirror maze that was navigated by smell. One by one, visitors entered the mirror maze, and to find their way through it, they were encouraged to follow their nose. At the end of the maze was an ultrasonic oscillator, a machine that turned liquid into vapour, releasing a smell. The aim for the visitor was to navigate the disorientating mirror maze by following the smell, which got stronger and stronger as the visitor got closer to the end of the maze. The smell that was released was a heady mixture of a number of different scents, including blackberry, dried figs, juniper, polished leather, smoked and cured venison and wild cherry. It also included smell taken from an oak tree that was alive during Shakespeare's lifetime and two naturally occurring aphrodisiacs. While not a conventional staging of a play, this performative installation is a theatrical design based on a playtext. The smell is not used merely to provide an extra layer of detail to the theatrical world, but rather is a core aesthetic component of the work. It's a mixture of different odours that combine to produce an artistic experience. Each component is not a simple representation of something in the play. Instead, it works according to the artistry of smell, like a perfume, it's been designed, crafted and created. Like any form of abstract art, we can understand it in terms of personal pleasure, whether we like it or not, in terms of the mood or feelings it might evoke, or in terms of the cultural or personal associations we have of individual elements or notes in the fragrance. So how might we understand the design of this particular smell? We can think of it in relation to the play, where perhaps the earthy smell of polished leather is reminiscent of the dirty clothes in the laundry basket in which Falstaff hides in The Merry Wives of Windsor. Or the lightheadedness that comes from the aphrodisiacs starts to produce the whirling feelings of falling in love, a key theme of the play. Maybe the smells of fruits start to stir feelings of hunger, 
Or the mixture of wood and smoke brings memories of snuggling around a fire, of warmth and comfort. Or possibly it sets off a chain of thinking around the difference between the traditional smells of wood set against the modern, shiny, polished surfaces of the mirrors that surround you. There are so many ways that we might experience or interpret the smell. It's designed to be open to a range of different experiences and interpretations. When I spoke to Sam Bompass of Bompass and Par about the process of designing and making, he said, with most projects, we start with the experiential. We'll start with language, with the language of an individual going through the whole experience. We then start building onto it the design, what it looks like, what it tastes like. You start with the experience and gradually add in layers and layers around how the whole thing is choreographed. So Bompass and Parr's design process starts with an experience that they want to offer. They'll work through how that experience can be expressed in language, using language to reflect on and develop the work, as well as to facilitate collaboration with others, transforming the idea for the experience into a concrete reality. They will then add layers so that the design builds until it reaches its final form. From these examples, we can start to tease out some principles and working practices for designing multisensory performance worlds. To work with materials that appeal to touch, smell or taste alongside hearing and vision opens up possibilities for performance design. It allows designers to create rich, complex and layered worlds for performance practice. Theatre design is not just the creation of a house or frame for the performance. The design of the space itself is part of the work. It functions as a core element of the overall performance event. We can include materials and objects that appeal to different sensory modes, as well as considering how all of the different sensory elements work together to create the overall experience of the space and of the event. Each of the senses has its own qualities and ways of offering an experience to which we need to be attentive when we're crafting designs. Vision involves shape, colour, graphics and imagery, whereas hearing includes attentiveness to pitch, harmonics, spatial acoustics, rhythm, tempo and timbre. Touch works through texture, temperature and weight, smell through mixtures, intensities and odour characteristics like woodiness, fruitiness, spiciness or pungency. Taste operates through the five basic tastes, sweet, salt, sour, bitter and umami, through mouthfeel, texture and temperature and a huge range of flavours. Each of these sensory modes can be considered, used and deployed artistically outside of our everyday ways of sensing. The use of different sensory elements in the design of a performance world can add richness and detail, as with Punch Drunk's work. Or the different sensory elements can take a more significant role in the work, foregrounded as a key artistic element, taking a starring rather than supporting role. And Bompass and Parr's The Waft That Woos reveals to us that design is not static. Just as the experience of the smell changes as the visitor moves through the mirror maze, so too does design more generally shift and change as the theatrical event progresses. And so designers need to consider how the design will unfold over time, the ways in which it will transform over the length of a, of a performance event, in the same way that performers have to consider the development of a character over the course of a play. The process of actually crafting and deploying sensory elements as part of a design are varied. Designers will work in different ways. However, we can identify some key principles for designing. Designers will work from their artistic intuition, where ideas for elements arise seemingly spontaneously. Design ideas can be developed and enriched through an associative process, 
making connections between ideas and materials to start that process of layering mentioned by Sam Bompas. This might be about forging a connection between one sensation and another, like the similarities between the feel of salt and the feel of sand. Or it might be about making a connection via language. For example, connecting the cold temperature of metal with the feeling of coolness that comes from the taste of mint. This is part of the expansive development process of designing, producing a range of creative ideas, identifying different materials that could be used, and creating a bank of possibilities on which the designer can draw to pull together a final considered design one that has artistic and conceptual coherence and that can offer the audience a multifaceted aesthetic experience.